Welcome to the Dirt on the Past, the Museum Edition, a YouTube and podcast program of the Extreme History Project, which explores ancient and historical topics relating to artifact collections from the Museum of the Rockies right here in Bozeman, Montana. At Extreme History, we explore the good, the bad, and the ugly about our human past because, let's face it, history isn't pretty. But it's so important to know because it's at the very thing that has led us to the most critical concerns in the present. So join me, Nancy Mahoney, and me, Crystal Alegria, as we talk to archaeologists and historians who have been digging in the dirt, and in the archives, and in museum collections to uncover fascinating histories that are relevant to today's issues, and can help us move forward with a deeper understanding of the past. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we are the co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week, we're at the Museum of the Rockies in the E.L. Wigan Digital Learning Studio with our guest, Dr. Sarah Kies. So we have been collaborating with the Museum of the Rockies. And of course, we're here in Bozeman, Montana. And we're bringing you this newer version of the podcast called the Dirt on the Past Museum Edition. I, I did it for you there. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was ready this I time. know you were. <laughs> I cut you off. Um, now our podcasts have the video component, so you can see us as well as our guests. And we often show artifacts from the Museum of the Rockies collection. So as we said, today we're joined by Sarah Kais, and we're going to be talking about her new book, American Burial Ground, A New History of the Overland Trail. Thanks for showing that, Crystal. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Fantastic. She um, she found her way through the dinosaur hall. So I'm very grateful <laughs> yeah, for that. True. Okay. Um, so we'd like to start off by telling our guests a little bit, our, our listeners rather, a little bit about our guests. So Sarah Kais is an assistant professor of history at the University of Nevada, Reno. She specializes in the 19th century history of the American West with a focus on the environment and intercultural interactions between indigenous peoples and Euro-Americans. I got that one out. That's good. Her current work <laughs> explores these topics along the overland trails to Oregon and California in the mid-19th century. And it's presented in her first book, American Burial Ground, A New History of the Overland Trail. So this was just recently published by University of Pennsylvania Press in October of 2023. Yes, that's is that right. right. That's exciting. Kais has also begun work on her second project, a regional and transnational study of suffrage in the U.S. West, which mm -hmm. I think that sounds really we're going to have to have yeah. Sarah back for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll try to write quickly. Yes, yes. Write quickly. yes. Well, you know, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. Do it right. <laughs> so um, you were recently awarded a Mellon Schlesinger Summer Research Grant by the Schlesinger Library at Harvard University mm -hmm. for this work. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Well, Sarah, we're so excited to talk to you today about the Overland Trail and all the associated trails that go with that. But first, we really want to ask you how you got interested in history. What mm -hmm. brought you, you to the field of history? Such a good question and one that's always hard for me to answer because I honestly can't ever think of a time when I wasn't interested in history. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was always reading, um, you know, historical fiction books, even when I was quite young, right? So when I just started reading like six, seven, eight. Um, but I think a, a real turning point for me that really deepened my interest in history was just a chance to travel the West, mm -hmm. right? So we would take driving trips in the summer with my family and and we would go, you know, to museums and national park sites um, and that experience was really different than the experience I was having in reading these early history books. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. a lot of those early history books were, you know, the Revolutionary War and like men fighting around spindly trees. And I just didn't recognize that landscape mm -hmm. in the West. Yeah. Um, I remember one trip we took, we went down into the Southwest when I was about eight um, and we went to um, Chaco Canyon. Uh. Yeah, 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 it's amazing. amazing. It's what amazing. do you like about it? Um, well, everything. I'm an archaeologist, and I remember not really knowing about it until I moved out west. I was interested in archaeology in Cyprus, in the Mediterranean. And when I saw Chaco Canyon, that was it for me. I switched to doing the Four Corners area, ancestral Pueblo and communities. It blew my mind. It's some of the most beautiful, interesting architecture, and a lot of it is still... Um, 
under discussion about how it all mm-hmm. came to be and why it didn't persist longer. It's an amazing place mm-hmm. in the middle of the desert. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so you articulated that, articulated that so much better than my eight-year-old self could when I went to that site. But I remember that I was there. And just like you, I had this feeling that it blew my mind. Right. I didn't know anything like this existed in my region. Nothing had prepared me to understand this. And I just remember asking my mom to buy me every single book in the gift shop that we could get our hands on that would help me know more about this. Um, And that was really the moment when I felt really connected to the history of the region. And then I also began to see the ways in which perhaps the West, and particularly the history of Native peoples, hasn't been seen as as central to U.S. history, even though it absolutely is. And there's a depth there that I think really connects our landscape to a longer history that isn't always as obvious to folks. I think that's incredibly well put because that theme really comes through in Mm -hmm. this book. And I I haven't read other uh, work by you, but this, your book and your perspective on it really blew me away. Um, So we mentioned that the topic today is your book and it's about this new history of the Overland Trail. That's your post colon title. Mm -hmm. Um, And you take a a deeper and more analytical look. You're looking at cultural practices surrounding the creation, the use of the Overland Trail, uh, its place in the American imagination, and the long-term consequences of caring for the remains of the overlanders who perished on the trail before they got to California. And a lot of that, I I think you mentioned at one point in the book, or maybe a, a, a previous podcast you did, that the Overland Trail seems like that's a history that's been done. Mm-hmm. And it, it it didn't feel like a topic that might be ripe for a fresh approach. And so it really interested me to hear that you were coming to speak and that this book was out and I wanted to understand more and what you talk, what you just mentioned about native people being so much more central to understanding the history of this country and their perspective, their role, that all, all surrounding that. So for me, that's what you were able to do in this book to give a whole new understanding to the trail. So let me say a little bit more and then I'll get to my question. Um, So you speak to the thousands of people who traveled out on that trail, Euro-Americans, the epidemics, the diseases, um, and the violence uh, that ultimately littered the trail with over 6,000 probably human remains. That's an estimate, I suppose. Um, But this is not a book that is meant to um, recount pioneer heroics and their hardships. So I I personally was blown away because you present a history of the trail in an entirely new context of this early mid 19th century death and dying and the profound existential and cultural challenges that the overlanders themselves faced in dealing with that. When a loved one or fellow traveler died along the route, they're away from family, they're in a strange land. But then you broaden this out to a context that includes this very long fight. I don't think I ever understood really how many decades before the Indian Removal Act was passed that people knew this was coming and they were fighting it in so many different ways. So fight by these indigenous nations to prevent forced removal from their homelands, which were recognized as such because they contained the burial grounds of their ancestors. Mm -hmm. So the link between burial grounds, placemaking and sovereignty is really made explicit in your book and your thesis that the graves of the overlanders who died along the trail eventually becomes a reason for the U.S. government to lay claim to indigenous lands and ultimately um, is a means of dispossession and colonization. Now I'll get to my question. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) That was a lot. That was a lot of background. And we want to get into more of that. But first, we just thought maybe you can begin for everybody by giving us some of that background. So begin by giving us some background on how many people decided to travel west on these overland trails because there's really more than one Mm -hmm. where they split um who were those people and then why were they going knowing it was likely to be such a perilous journey yeah absolutely right why would you put yourself in that situation right right um and i mean the reasons for that are really material and cultural um but you know let's start with the rough numbers from 1840 to 1860, you have over 250,000 
people traveling, as you say, these multiple uh, trails. And, you know, that doesn't stop in 1860. So, you know, one of the older features of trail history is that by the Civil War, this is over. We've moved on to a new era in the 19th century. But that's not true. People keep traveling. And in fact, some historians have done research that there's actually an uptick in immigration west during the Civil War because things are so fraught um, on the edge of the United States. And then, you know, certainly the train's going to come in, but that doesn't mean that people still aren't using wagons and traveling overland. Um, but I don't know if we want to talk a little bit about the routes because I do use the singular term yes. overland trail in the book. I don't know if we want and to. And let's show. go ahead and switch to our overhead so we can get a, a graphic that's in your book. So maybe you could use this and, and yeah, write out. That'd be perfect. So this is a wonderful map that I worked with a excellent cartographer for the book, Erin Greb, who's credited here. Um, and she did such a good job. I really wanted to display the trail not as a single linear line over the main trunk, but this web and this network of routes that immigrants used. And these are these are routes like we talked about with the deeper history of the West and Native peoples. Many of these trail routes had been in use for some time. Right. They had existed to some extent or all, even Lewis and Clark when they came out much earlier. Right. So, yes. okay. So these trails existed, but they become part of ways yes. to get west. Yes, exactly. They do become part of the ways for immigrants to get west. And they're taking these different routes, but uh, the journey is really linked in people's minds as this monumental migration where you want to get to the Pacific coast. And so regardless of the specific location of where they traveled, the meaning of this experience of making it all to the way to the west um, create sort of a link and a synonymity between all of these roots in people's minds, both then and now. So absolutely, we need to be precise and distinctive about the physical location of peoples as they travel. But this idea of taking this westward journey overland um, is really key. And one of the ways we can see this um, being articulated in the past in the United States is that when the when the over when the Library of Congress creates a subject heading for all of these immigrant diaries, they just create one overland journeys to the really? Pacific. Wow. Yeah. And so huh. you can further parse them with Santa Fe, but there's one major category when you're looking through the catalog for those. Um, and so I fell in line with that because I do take such a cultural approach to this migration. And that's something that's distinctive about this book um, as well. That's great. That's great. Well, I wanted to continue on and talk a little bit about um, this trail, but some of the other trails that you talk about in the beginning of the book as well. So um, in the first chapter, you really talk about the twin migrations of the Overland Trail and the Native American people being removed from their homelands. And so we probably think about this when we think back to our, our history books, we think about the the Trail of Tears, about the Cherokee Trail of Tears. But you really, in the book, go much more in depth and talk about just not the Cherokee Trail of Tears, but all these different migrations of Native people, Indigenous people out of their homelands. And so if you could talk a little bit about that, Sarah, um, and then also, could you talk about how these um, Indigenous removals from homelands are linked with the Overland Trail? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And that was the piece of the book that took me the longest to figure out. Yeah. Um, and I also think it's the piece of the book, and you all sort of gestured to this as well from your reading, that I think makes the most difference to the story. Um, and so it took me a long time. I was very committed to it. Uh, and, I, and I really think that I wouldn't have been able to write this new history of the Overland Trail if it wasn't for the way that the field of Native history and Western history has developed even in the past five to eight years with these books that have come out. And so I'm I'm really indebted to earlier Overland Trail scholars, but I'm also very much indebted to this newer scholarship that's foregrounding Native people in U.S. history. And in order to see the big picture or what a historian at the University of Georgia, Claudio Sant, calls deportations, because he makes an argument that in fact these forced removals are the first chance that the modern U.S. state has to sort of practice these efforts to forcibly expel people from the United States. And so he sees them as a, as a story of tragedy, not only for Native peoples, but also for the creation of the United States' deportation apparatus, um, which I find is a really dark and compelling argument. So 
Claudio Sant's work was very important. And then there's work by historians like John Bowes and Jeffrey Osler, who I cite, who do an absolutely fantastic job. And that, you know, the Cherokee story is so iconic, the Trail of Tears, but that's just one nation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And so now when we see the most multiplicity of nations who the United States removed and the trails that really web across the continent in the similar way that the voluntary migration routes web across the continent, we get a much more complete picture of the scale of these forced removals and the impact they had on Native peoples and on the lands that eventually the United States take. That was a really helpful graphic also that you've mm -hmm. had. Maybe we can just overlay that, right? Thanks so much, Ashley. Um, all of these, I had to go through each one. There's nine different, and I had no idea how many were coming from much farther north mm -hmm. along the Great Lakes region and again, out west. I was thinking more of the Southern mm -hmm. examples that I was more familiar with. I had no idea. Yeah, and that's really a key contribution that John Bowes made in a recent book. Um, and then Jeffrey Osler built off of that in his book, Surviving Genocide. Um, and so, as I said, I'm indebted to their scholarship here, but I really love how this visual displays that. And you can also see, you asked about the connection between the voluntary overland trail and forced removal routes, what we can see in this map is that these people are ending up on the eastern edges of the trail. So there's an over classic overland trail spot, Independence, Missouri, right? Right up there right. along the edge. Right where the taking off points mm -hmm. are. And they're being completely removed from here. They're over the mountains, the Mississippi, and then that's it. It's like they want them to stay here and they don't want them to go farther west. I mean, I guess they know there's other folks out there, mm -hmm. but you, it seems like that's not by accident. Mm -hmm. There's already these designs on what might be to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, and actually this, so another way I was able to make this, this link between these two very distinctive migrations, but the voluntary migration of the Overland Trail was really influenced by this anti-colonial movement that Native peoples um, engage in, you know, for decades, as you were gesturing to earlier, and it's an anti-colonial movement that's based on a defense of homelands because of their possession through their ancestors' graves and how that makes those homelands sacred and emotionally, and how they're emotionally attached to them and how that's an enduring attachment that cannot be sundered. And there's actually one of the foremost proponents of removal who led me to understand this connection because Andrew Jackson President Andrew Jackson, who many people know, um, really pushes the Removal Act through Congress. It barely passes. I didn't realize it was that close. It's so close. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a, that was a, also, again, you just hear about it, but I didn't really know. It, right. It was literally just could have been an, another person or two. Yeah. It's, it's such a good example of the contingent nature mm -hmm. of U.S. history and mm -hmm. specifically the ways in which. Yes. Yes. Um, which is another another theme in U.S. history and in the book. Um, but Andrew Jackson, he's giving a speech to Congress after the Removal Act has passed, and he's basically giving them an update on how it's going. And, you know, spoiler alert, it's really not going well because um, the government doesn't care to preserve Native life on removals. They're underfunded. They're ill-organized. And Claudio Sant's book is really useful for understanding that aspect of it. But Jackson's giving an update, and he's trying to to make it sound because Congress was so split, that it's really not so bad. And one of the things he says is that, you know, honestly, what Native peoples are doing because, you know, we're forcing them to do it is really no different than immigrants who are voluntarily going West looking for new opportunity is what he, why would he say that? Like, like, what is he saying here? And then I, I began to, to do more research and see the ways in which not only dispossession enables expansion and possession of whites, but the ways in which the conversations Native peoples had pushed to the center about graves as not only markers, but claims to space will also begin to infuse these voluntary westward migrations um, because they're, they're using similar ideas to justify expansion, um, just as Native peoples had tried to, to fight dispossession with them. That linkage is is pretty powerful. Um, and again, to come from that source, that was mm -hmm. a revelation for me in your book. But also, can you, before we move on, tie in how the very powerful arguments that spoke to a lot of other Americans about 
anti-removal because of where their ancestral burial grounds are, this tie to this place, mm-hmm. because that is not a new thing or a thing only that Native American uh, people in those regions felt strongly about. Mm-hmm. People all over, anthropologically, you know, mm-hmm. we see that's very much how you lay claim and feel that you are in your homeland. Um, so there were people who were very empathetic to that, as we see that whole idea, a very close vote. Um, so to lessen the strength of that side of the argument is this idea of the vanishing Indian. So to talk a little bit about that and how you weave that into this period to explain that the forced removals. Yeah, so the idea of the vanishing Indian is this fallacious mythology that whites use where they basically say nothing we do, no actions that we take um, against Native people matter because their history has already been written and their history is one of death and disappearance. So um, Alexander de Tocqueville, who famously comes to visit the United States, um, has this really great critique of white Protestant Americans. And he says they're doing all of these things. They're dispossessing Native peoples. They're forcing them out. Um, they're using violence against them. But they they wake up in the mirror and they feel just fine with themselves because they say, well, I haven't actually done anything because this was all going to happen anyway. Um, and so that's a way in which um, white Americans skirt the blame um, for dispossession. And it's also a way that they can make an argument that Native graves left behind don't really belong to native lands or native peoples anymore because they're gone. And so white Americans as the new settlers in this region will become sort of the new protectors and memorializers of these dead who are a people of the past. And when the native people make their argument, it's very much an argument of their presence. There's a lot going on in anthropology and archaeology at this time where they're digging into Mm -hmm. very visible burial mounds and doing a lot of um, development of scientific racism and all kinds of things at this time, too, that's helping to build these narratives. So just from the fields that I'm um, steeped in, there's a lot there's a lot there. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and I don't mention this in this book. But you but mentioned I, Skull Collectors. The book yes, by, I yes, do. Yeah. Oh, I love that yeah, book. Yeah, that's a great book. Yeah. Yep. And Fabian is fantastic. Um, but in St. Louis, mm. which becomes a pivotal point in the Overland Trail story as well, right? That's one of the places where when settlers move in, move in they're actively destroying these mounds, right. these burial yeah, mounds. The burial mounds. Yes, yeah. exactly. So I think that's a really good example. Yeah. Yeah, so the erasure is is happening in so many ways. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so we've we've getting some of the background there, and I want to move on to um, a little bit more about what's really killing people on the trail. Um, and there's been other uh, academics who have pointed out, I think going back maybe even into the 1980s, 1990s, that there isn't really a lot of evidence that that many people. Euro Americans died on the trail at the hand of Native people. Yes. There wasn't that kind of violence that was responsible for the death that happened. Um, but you've talked about the epidemics, and in particular, cholera, which swept through uh, the United States, or what it was at that point, in 1832, in 1849, again in 1866. And on the Overland Trail, it was cholera that was so deadly. And you say people were expecting to find themselves at the mercy of native people, of weather, of exposure, of of maybe starvation, but instead they found themselves dying from what is typically thought of as a more urban disease. So talk to us a little bit about why cholera was so devastating for the overlanders, but also for all the indigenous people who lived in the places that they were moving through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so in this time period in the United States, disease and whether you get sick or not is really tied to questions of morality and virtue and social status. So in the United States, um, a lot of native-born white Protestants blame immigrants who live in the most crowded, dense urban centers for getting cholera, that it has to do with the fact that they drink too much or they have loose morals or all of these other things. I mean, cholera is a bacteria that spread most easily through water sources. So, you know, if you drink water that has it in it, like you're very likely um, to get sick and die. Um, At the same time that these sort of poorer neighborhoods and growing urban centers in the United States are seen as sources of disease, 
there's a parallel development that says that the West and the Plains are the healthiest region in the world. So Francis Parkman, the Bastonian, who becomes a, a very famous historian in the United States, takes a journey across the Plains, across the Overland Trail in the early 1840s, um, precisely for this reason for questions of health and innervation and strength. Um, and so when emigrants are sort of gathering on the edges of the trail, even as they know there's cholera in the United States in 1849, they're saying, you know, as long as we can get across this line, um, as long as we can get out into the West, we might be able to evade this disease. Um, it doesn't happen. It, no it, such luck. <laughs> partly doesn't happen because they don't wash their hands and right. they don't know where they should go to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and it's it's just simply crowded, right? That's one of the other old tropes of the trail is that there's a string of covered wagons and then just empty, gorgeous plains landscape, right? But this is this is a crowded migration. One of the immigrants who traveled in this gold rush time period of 1849 says, you know, the trail reminds him of being on Broadway in New York City. Because you, you had to leave at a certain time weather-wise to make it across. So it wasn't like people were just whenever they wanted going. So yeah, right. the, the crowding. Right, exactly. So it's crowded. And in fact, you know, we were talking about the nature of routes and how people travel. So cholera makes immigrants run away from other immigrants. So they'll actually like, they'll be on the main line. They'll see it's crowded. They're worried. They've heard there's cholera up ahead. And so they'll do a diversion off. And so there's mm -hmm. these little spikes that grow as as people are going off the trail. Um, and immigrants who've been primed to see quite wrongly, Native peoples as aggressors, which as you point out, has has long been disproven, uh, they'll actually say, you know, I'm going to take my choice. Like, I, I would rather go out on my own with my small company than stay along this main route and potentially get cholera. And so you can see these, these calculations that they're making. Now, so for immigrants, cholera on the plains is something that's really new and different, and it challenges their conceptions of the trail in the West. And it's really going to set the groundwork for making the trail into this American burial ground. Uh, for Native peoples, you know, cholera is part of a really long, dark history of settlers bringing diseases and decimating them. And so, you know, Native peoples could have told the immigrants that they could just as well get disease on the plains, right? These are peoples who've dealt with smallpox um, and other diseases that have been brought by colonizers and cholera is another phase in that destruction. Um, it's also a moment where Native peoples like the Lakota and the Cheyenne realize the extent of the dangers of this immigration that that really started as a trickle and then gets much larger during the gold rush period. And so Lakota say the immigrants bring disease on their bodies. Um, the Cheyenne, you know, point to immigrants as sort of setting off what they see as a major moment of demographic destruction of their nation. Um, and it is there's a major outbreak in the summer of 1849. Um, in a you know multi nation camp that's part of a gathering close to the trail, and it's it's really devastating. So native people are talking about this, mm -hmm. and they're aware of it, and it just seems like that part of the narrative is always left out when we learn or talk about these overland trails and the pioneers and what they were afraid of. Mm -hmm. they don't really bring that history in as much. And as you said, I feel like a lot is changing in, in the histories that mm -hmm. we're telling now. Mm -hmm. And that's such an important component. Yeah. yeah. And that, and um, I'm really indebted to um, two historians who've worked on this. They published a few articles about um, native people's reactions to cholera on the immigrant trail. So that was a big, big component of my research there. Um, Ramon Likers and James um, Powers. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Well, you know, that was, that was surprising to me. I had heard that disease was a big factor in all these deaths, but cholera, being cholera specific, that was really interesting. So I, I, I love the whole chapter uh, about cholera but, and, and all the people that were dying of cholera, but there were people dying of other things as well, um, just old age or sickness. And, you know, if you can imagine these people who have lived in urban centers, just up and going across the plains. And we know living in Montana and in these barren places mm -hmm. that the the elements are rough. You know, you have to be prepared um, for living in a whole different landscape. And so that probably played in a lot as well as, as you do say. And you don't even drive to Missoula. I know. Storm, you, you know. I mean, we just <laughs> don't. Yeah. Right. And, and the heat that they must have oh. encountered. But Regardless, a lot of people were dying along this trail, and that caused a lot of 
um, emotional heartache, of course, for these people who then had to leave their family members in a in a grave, in a semi-marked grave, not always even really marked like they were used to, um, thinking about the cemeteries back east and thinking about these beautiful, um, you know, um, places of rest as they called them, you know, so this was a whole different ball game out here. They had to find places to bury their loved ones and then just leave them. And so I think about the, some of the trauma that some of this imposed on these people who then settled in the West too. And, and we talk a lot about that, about the trauma that um, people were settling in the West were having from the fighting in the Civil War, but I had never really thought about the trauma that people were experiencing on this trail that then they they lived with the rest of their lives. But anyway, when people were sick and dying, those um, they had to be cared for. And then when they were dying, they were dying in ways that were not wonderful, like dying in the, you know, the back of a wagon box being jostled all around on this trail. And, and then they had to find a place to bury their loved ones. So it's this whole strange idea of, um, you know, burying someone outside of a cemetery, outside of this, this sacred place. And that really then ties into the sacredness that this trail becomes. But anyway, so I want you to talk a little bit about that. But then I also want to talk about, um, I want you to talk about your discussion that you you have in the book about how these people are used to burying their their folks underground. The white Americans coming along the trail are used to burying people underground. And being on the plains, they're seeing tribal nations who bury their their people above ground. So that juxtaposition too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're absolutely I think your your comments are just so spot on because that was one of the things I really thought a lot about when I was writing the book and particularly this chapter you're pointing us to, sort of the middle chapter. That that middle chapter is really sort of like the seed of the of the rest of the chapters. Like I was like, there's a lot more to do here and to say because this was so important to them. But certainly trauma is at the center of that. And there's quite a bit of scholarship on civil war trauma. And I saw many of the same themes playing out on the trail. But this is happening, you know, decades earlier. Yeah. So I think that's really significant to think about. Um, and also the imagery of death on the trail. Uh, just as force removals preceded the voluntary migration on the Overland Trail, the imagery of death on the trail precedes imagery of death in the Civil War. But there's a lot of thematic linkages with exposed bodies and vultures overhead and all of these things. Um, and so I think that might help us to, to rethink the chronology of death in the 19th century United States. Um, but, you know, immigrants are really committed to trying to make the burials look as close to as what they would like to have had at home as possible. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in order to do that, they do things that they would never have done at home. I mean, they talk about gathering extra wagon boards, um, from their company. They look for pieces of cracker barrel in piles of abandoned debris on the trail and i mean they never say this but to not put too fine a gloss on it they're basically using trash to wrap the dead because they don't have the wood to construct the coffins that they want to have um but they they they're so committed to these barriers and this use of wood in particular that they'll do anything to get even fragments of it so that i think is just sign of a deep cultural commitment and an inflexibility but one of the things that that surprised me, and you mentioned the difference between Protestant focus on burying underground and then tribal nations' use of aerial scaffolds or sky burials on the plains. One of the things that that surprised me is the syncretism of burials and the ways in which um, Native peoples like the Lakota adopted some elements of white burial practices. So using wooden coffins and placing them on top of elevated scaffolds or draping the wooden coffin in an American flag, which was a sign of their beneficial alliance with the United States in the 1850s. And then on the part of white immigrants, um, these people who traveled the trail, you know, they'd read about Native peoples, they'd read racist stories of of violent savages, they'd seen images of 
burials in the West that were designed to make them look down their noses at sky burials as inferior and backward um, and bad for the dead. And they get out on the planes and they have this really strong fear. And there's some evidence that they, they should be fearful of this, that wolves are digging up the dead on the trail, that they're digging up these immigrant burials. And a, a few of the immigrants start to say, well, given this context in this strange environment that I'm not accustomed to, um, should should we be considering this other option that native peoples use? And so there's actually a conversation about that, which is really, I think it's significant, even though it doesn't come to full fruition, because it shows the ways in which how to bury the dead is is such an important question. And then how ultimately immigrants as a whole double down on below ground, in the ground burials, even though that might not have really fulfilled their hopes for maintaining and preserving the sanctity of the corpse in the ways that perhaps being more flexible would have. Right. This chapter was pretty amazing, I have to say. <laughs> and it and it just um, brought up so much food for thought about those two ideas. But I want to talk a little bit about, I want to continue that conversation and talk a little bit about some of the artifacts that the Museum of the Rockies has. Because as you were saying, people were um were were burying their their folks in in anything that they had. Wood was the best, but if they didn't have wood, then they would bury them in blankets, in quilts, in robes. And so we have a quilt from the Museum of the Rockies that was brought west over one of these trails. Wow. So let me grab um let me grab the quilt and maybe Nancy you can um I'll move the book yeah. and we will um have it out here and we can talk a little bit about um what we know of the quilt which was donated. So we have a little bit of that there. Okay. Well done, Crystal. That's a big do you want to do it the other way just because I'm not sure we have enough there? Oh no, I mean there we go. Oh wow. Okay. So let's see. Let me get to my quilt notes here. So um this is a this is a quilt that was brought by a, a woman whose name was Lucy Nave Tinsley. And the and by her family, and this is called a log cabin design quilt. And you can you can completely see the log cabin design <laughs> that is on here. But um, Lucy Nave Tinsley came across the Oregon Trail, and she came with her family, and they came up then the Bozeman Trail to Virginia City, Montana, and um, and so she had this this quilt in her family. So when we were talking about doing this podcast with you, we asked the museum if they had anything in their collection that would kind of represent the um, the Overland Trail or any of the trails, the Oregon Trail, the Bozeman Trail. And so Melissa Dawn, who is the, um, the curator, the collections um, person here, um, gave us a list of a few objects. And we picked this quilt because in your book, you talk a lot about how um, people were buried in quilts. Mm -hmm. And so um, so I think this is appropriate for that conversation, it, you know, that idea of burying them in a shroud or shrouding them mm -hmm. in personal belongings like these quilts. Of course, this quilt made it all the way to Montana. It's amazing. And it is now in the collections here at the Museum of the Rockies. And as you can see, it's pretty fragile. It's pretty... Um, it's there is some fraying along the edges and Melissa um, gave us explicit instructions not to touch the quilt. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to look at it. So we're, we're just going to look at it. Looking at it. And I think from what we know about this, that she made another quilt along the way they talk about, but this was made in the, in the mid to late 1850s. Correct. So it was definitely before the Civil War, and then this journey was made, maybe even before the Bozeman Trail. We're going to look mm -hmm. into that to see, but they did end up at Virginia City. And the reason John Bozeman started that trail was because it was a, a faster way to get to those gold fields when they were discussed. But but then, um, so the fact that it was preserved and, and passed down is amazing, but it could have just as easily ended up uh, being used for somebody who passed along the way. So... Um, 
I wanted to ask this question, and I don't know if you have an answer, Sarah, when you have been mentioning wood and why wood is so important. I don't actually really know a lot of the history of being buried in a wooden box. Mm -hmm. Do you know a little bit more about, I, I mean, I had, I had, I know about sort of the development, especially on the East Coast of certain types of cemeteries once they move away from being adjacent to a, a church or sure. a cathedral. But sure. but can you talk a little bit about that and being buried a certain, you know, distance under the ground mm -hmm. in a wooden coffin and, you know, this belief that your whole body then would then still be around when there's, um, what do we call it? The yeah. whole, yeah, the rapture. Yes. yes. Resurrection, okay. resurrection and, and okay. yeah, the the uh, maintaining the pres For preserving the physical okay. remains as much as possible. So, you know, by the time immigrants are traveling in the 1840s and 1850s, this idea of using the wood in the coffin box is is really well established. Um, and the wood really is, um, from what I know, about that preservation. Now, when that became so critical, I can't can't give you an exact date on that, but I know it's very um, common by this point. Um, and I also know that, you know, quilts like this one, it wasn't used, but as you said, it could have been used, are often seen as the next best thing because they will literally layer up the bodies. They might put all of their clothing on them and then wrap them in quilts like mm -hmm. this. And then for, in some instances, they tie them really tight in the hopes that that will provide um, extra security for the body. And then in some cases, and I and this is fascinating to me. Um, that if we think of coffins as being to help preserve the body, then why, when they bury some, do they wrap them in all of this bedding, but then cut the grave to resemble the shape of a tapered wooden coffin, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. so it is about, you know, a material element of these burials, but it's also just doing whatever they could to make these burials look okay to make them palpable, even though they're so distinct. Are they able to get six feet down? Are they able, what are the tools they have with them? Where are they? Or do they sometimes have to settle for something short of that? They often do have to settle for something short of that six feet. Um, and the tools they have with them depends on the company they're with, um, how much time they have to bury the body. Um, you know, there's this, this one really sort of dark incident where... Um, a wagon train is taking a body with them because they think they'll be able to find a better spot to bury the body where there might be some more wood available or the ground might be easier to dig into. Um, and they have a woman riding with the dead man in the wagon um, and there's an accident and she falls out and she dies okay. in that accident. Um, and so now they have two. And so they just make one larger grave, which is again, not the normal practice for Protestants because you want the individual memorial for the deceased. Um, but, you know, quilts were definitely, definitely a big part of this. And they're a symbol of white civilization. They're a symbol of women and domesticity and homemaking. So I think that also has a lot to do with why they're included in these burials. Feeling cared for. Feeling and, cared and for. when you're away from the ability for your family. Okay. And then we have another artifact too, that would be um, wonderful to look at. Are you okay with that crystal? Okay. I'll move this one over. Okay. All right. So this also comes from the collections here at Museum of the Rockies, and it was donated. Um, do you have? Okay, you're I pulling do. up the information. All right. Because <laughs> there's speculation about this one. But, yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. So this, um, this, this, this object that we're looking at right now, this spur, has been uh, attributed to John Bozeman. And if you haven't seen our podcast on John Bozeman, you should listen to that one um, because we do in that one talk about some objects that we do specifically know the provenance of and can trace those directly back to John Bozeman. Just tell them we have his gun here. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. Cool. Watch. Right, right. <laughs> and so, but this artifact, we did not talk about on the la that last podcast because this one is kind of they don't know for sure. So the tag that is printed on one side says C.A. Fields, birds for sale. And then handwritten on the other side is written, this spur, John Bozeman War, conducting the first train across from the Platte River to Virginia City via the Bighorn Mountains in 1864. So 
So we thought it would be really interesting to bring this artifact out because it is an artifact that is linked to John Bozeman, but his time on the trail. Mm -hmm. So this kind of goes into some th the conversation we'll have next about how um, these trails became very m memorialized and popular in our public image. And even artifacts are associated with that memorialization. So it's interesting to me that the tag says that this was attributed to John Bozeman, not just that, but that he wore it on the trail. So, yes. so if, if you want to speak to that a little bit, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is such a great artifact as well. And I, I absolutely agree with you that you know, it gives it an extra value to say that it went over the trail or it was used on the trail, right? I think of all of the, you know, the quite uh, ordinary assortment of household goods in, you know, a museum like the the Oregon Historical Society, you know, brooms and coffee pots and all of these <laughs> things, but they have that importance because they were on the trail. Um, actually, when I was doing research for this project, when I was a graduate student, I went to um, the Winter Tour Museum and Archives in Delaware, and they have a large um, collection of objects. And even there in Delaware, they had a couple quilts and then also dolls oh, that were marked right. as being taken on the Oregon Trail. Yeah. Well, I mean, who knows? Right. But that oh, was part of the family. Very lore. evocative, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. children were coming out. And, yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes, for sure. So I definitely see that artifact as falling in that vein. And again, this idea that not only people made it, but that their material goods, sort of these material items that have this cultural significance of children, domesticity, or, you know, the proper way to ride a horse, according to, to white Americans, is is really important that they didn't lose it all. They brought it with them. And that was how they worked to reassert, you know, American civilization in the West. Right. And so interesting to me, I, I know you mentioned this before, but in the book, you talk about how people had ideas and were envisioning the trail and had mm -hmm. all this imagery prior to even setting foot out on the trail you know, before even large numbers of people, there were all these stories and probably paintings and sketches and things that just gave people a sense of what they expected to find or see. Absolutely. So fascinating. So fascinating. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we want to switch um, uh, topics just a little bit here and talk about um, the Lakota. And you have in a chapter, a discussion about how the migration of overlanders through there was really like a destructive invasion. So not only were they bringing disease, but that process of coming through the area, there's hunting, there's over hunting, yeah. there's trampling of, of grasses. So there's impact on the whole environment, ecosystem, all of the things that Lakota people and of course all those around them need to survive. Um, and the, the livestock that might be coming out is eating up grass that local animals might be eating. So it's it's very much a disaster on a lot of levels for Native people in those areas. So could you talk a little bit in particular about the Lakota and um, how they tried to use some diplomacy and tie in and leverage the symbol of death? You mentioned an American flag draped over um, a, a, a scaffold burial, mm -hmm. and they wanted to try to push back against this migration and this colonialism um, uh, on their lands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that, that, you know, drawing us to the widespread environmental destruction of the trail is really important. And in some ways, and we talked about this before, there's a small window that immigrants travel, right? This is a seasonal migration, um, but their effects are felt throughout the year, right? And probably no worse time than winter when resources are at their lowest, but immigrants have gone. And, you know, Lakota people had and had established a beneficial relationship with the United States for some time. And the increase in overland immigration is going to change that calculus. Um, and again, I talked about the importance of of work on the history of Native peoples. You know, Pekka Hamalainen's work yeah. on Lakota yeah. America yeah. is is really pivotal for me to helping better understand what was going on at this time. But I also, in terms of centering the symbolism of the dead and thinking about the use of the dead and funerals as a form of diplomacy. I also see something different happening in this one instance um, than earlier historians. And and this this particular instance is the way in which the funeral of a teenage girl who's the daughter of a Lakota leader, mm -hmm. um, Spotted Tail, comes to see what I play as a pivotal role in Spotted Tail's attempt to not only compromise 
with the United States and United States officials, but also to reassert Lakota presence along the trail. Um, and what happens is that we're talking about the immediate post-Civil War period on the plains. There's been an uptick in this outright military aggression against Native peoples. Historians, you know, used to talk about this period post-Civil Wars, the, the Indian the Wars, Indian Wars yeah. which, you know, seems to suggest that, you know, Native peoples are, are attacking the United States. And it's it's really absolutely the reverse of that. These are defensive military maneuvers that are made to protect their families and their livelihood and their land in the face of U.S. going back on treaty agreements and the United States bringing more military forces to the plains. Um, you know, Jeffrey Osler's work I mentioned earlier, he's he's talked about force removals as a form of gen on his next book now, which deals with this later portion of Native history um, on the plains. And, you know, he says that some of these, these military battles where the Lakota were able to outmaneuver the United States, it's not simply that they they won, it's that they were they were literally on the cusp of you know a genocidal massacre and they were able to get out of it that that what we see as battles could have been so much worse if it wasn't for the military prowess of these nations um now spotted tail as a lakota leader has always been known for pursuing a path of diplomacy more than military aggression but one of the things i i notice in focusing on how he brings his daughter back to the united states back to fort laramie um, is how savvy he is and how much he's calling the United States out for their broken promises. So Fort Laramie, of course, is a major stopping point on the Overland Trail, but it also is and always has been a syncretic Lakota U.S. space, a, a space where they came to trade and collaborate um, for the good of both people in the 1850s. And by 1866, that isn't the case. But Spotted Tail... His daughter dies. And so he sends a message to the U.S. military commanders of Fort Laramie and says, you know, my daughter, Minnie Akui, has died. I'd like to bring her back to the fort. I'd like to bury her here. And the U.S. military officials are all excited. They're like, this is a sign he wants peace. And he does on some level, but he also wants to hold the U.S. feet to the fire with this ceremony. And he wants to use it as a way, not as acquiescence to U.S. presence, but to reassert Lakota presence at the fort. And so he brings her body in. And the subsequent ceremony that's conducted is very syncretic. So there's a bar there's a scaffold burial, which is in keeping with Lakota custom. There is, you know, somewhat of a Christian ceremony that's conducted by the military chaplain. But during the ceremony, Spotted Tail also has the chance to speak. And he talks about his people's long presence at the fort. You know, his his daughter is um, her remains are um, put on a scaffold very close to one of her relatives who was buried at the fort some time before. And so he he talks about this moment where the fort really was not only a U.S. space, but a Lakota space. And he reminds the U.S. of their obligations and hopes that they will do better in the future um, and not continue on this path of aggression and breaking promises. Um, and he leaves her body there. And it's a, a signal to the United States that their Lakota are still very much part of this place and also sort of a physical representation of Spotted Tail's hopes that the U.S. will change their course. Um, and the military officials say, hey, this means we've we've solved this problem and, and there's a different meaning for what Spotted Tail's trying to tell them. And by this point, the U.S., for reasons of racism, for reasons of aggressive um, seeking of lands, they, they just don't want to hear it. Kind of breaks your heart to it, yeah. hear that story, which you told very well. Yeah. The poignancy of, but it, it brings everything about the argument from the earlier portion of this period to that very troubling 1860s into 1870s period. It really links that and you. And there's this, a part two to that too, mm -hmm. which I don't know if we'll get to today, but read it in the book, <laughs> <laughs> which is yes. it's, um, equally poignant. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so as as time goes on, kind of moving forward in time here, um, this trail goes out of use. Um, but there's there's all these bodies that are on this trail. There's all these bodies that are strewn along this trail. 
And so because of that, people go back and visit these bodies. Um, they go back and visit their loved ones. And then monuments are put up. And then um, memorials are dedicated. And historical societies are formed. <laughs> and so, as you say in your book, Remembrances of the Dead played a key role in remaking the trail and the West at large into a white American space. So can you talk a little bit more about this memory making? And I love that term that you use in the book, memory making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is another sort of key aspect of my book that's that's really distinct from a lot of other trail histories that, I, as I mentioned before, you know, tend to really stop in the 1860s. Um, and I think we really need this longer scope to understand the trail because it is, as you said, people have preconceptions of what the journey will be. Well, they're also actively working to create memories of it through marking artifacts that's on the trail. Absolutely. Um, Ongoing. Day, yes. For sure. Yes. And there's a couple contingent events that that happen around the time of the Civil War that helped to set this into motion. And that's really, you know, two of the, you know, textbook markers of the history of the U.S. West, the Railroad Act and the Homestead Act okay. in 1862. So the Railroad Act, because the Confederates have left, means that the Union can take a more northern route, and that more northern route parallels the main trunk of the Overland Trail. And then the Homestead Act is going to help to ensure and support the expansion of white westward settlement in the late 19th century. So those two factors, the railroad and then white settlers, really support the memory making of the Overland Trail. Because the railroad wants to tell its the railroad companies want to tell their own history of monumental progress. And the trail graves are a wonderful foil. Look how dangerous and disastrous the trail was. You can see it from your car window. No, really, look over there. They literally have people on the trains pointing wow. people to these sites and some of these graves. And they're also mentioned in the guidebooks. So the railroads absolutely do this. And then they also talk about themselves as preserving trail graves. So we did the right thing. We, um, uh, you know, we recognize the sacredness of this legacy of those who have come before, you know, we came and we moved these bodies out of the way so they would be preserved, right, when the railroad came through. So that's a big part of the memory making there. And then white settlers are, play a really important role in this as well. So one of the areas I focus on in the book is Nebraska and the ways in which members of that historical society, society go out and mark these these graves um, and draw the attention of tourists and settlers to them as saying, look, this is our longer legacy in this landscape. Um, we often think of white settlement in the West as like you put up a fence, you put up a house, a church, a school, those are your signs of civilization. In step with that, they're marking these earlier burials because it helps to give legitimacy and length to their presence in these lands that really don't belong to them. Right. And these trails that work really created by the indigenous people. I mean, so there's so many layers to this kind of taking over of memory making and taking over and dispossession. And there's just, just, and so there's a lot to unpack in all of your chapters. And um, the book is so worth uh, a good read by people. And I know you are also tonight at Montana State University going to give a talk. And I think that's yes. going to be wonderful to, um, see your slide presentation as well as to hear you tell more of these stories. So we're coming to the close of our podcast and, and like we always do with our guests, especially historians, we like to ask them to bring our conversations about the past into the present, which we're already starting to do. And this tremendous legacy of the Overland Trail in this American story of westward expansion and all the ways in which uh, it has been told. Aside from the railroad and becoming highways and freeways and all of those. So, um, Sarah, what do you hope people take away from this book, this recontextualization of trail history um, that includes these ongoing Native challenges to mm -hmm. white narratives? Mm -hmm. What do you hope they take away from this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think really what I want people to take away is the realization I think there's sometimes a misconception in the work of historical interpretation that, oh, we need to add more voices now because that's what's important to us in our political moment. 
And what I'm trying to show in the book is that, no, it's not that we need to do this for reasons of the present. It's we need to do this because that's how we actually see the past as it was. And that's what I want people to walk away with. That trail history has always been part of a struggle and conversation that goes well beyond the white immigrants who dominated written accounts of this migration in the mid 19th century. That this is something that absolutely cannot be parsed from native history and native activism. And I think that a lot of things that are happening today, such as funding for the National Park Service for collaboration with tribal nations, are really important critical, and critical. And I think, I think we're at a really promising moment for rethinking how we interpret not only the history of the trail, but the history of the West and the United States. So Sarah, we are, like Nancy said, coming to the end of our conversation. And so we highly recommend this book. Um, it's a critical book to better understand the place that we all live, but also um, critically important to understand our nation as a whole and its, and its wider history. So Sarah, where can- Wider, we not whiter. Right. right. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Terrifying. Good Terrifying. job, Nancy. <laughs> so, Sarah, where can people find this book um, and, and more information about you, too, and in your upcoming book, which we hopefully <laughs> will have you back to talk about? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, so you can you can find the book online. Um, I'd recommend buying it from my press, University of Pennsylvania Press, but it's, it's also available on Amazon and at other um, retailers. And then for me, the best place to find me is to go to um, the University of Nevada, Reno, my faculty page. I have some information there and I, I try to keep it updated with some things I'm doing. So I'm looking forward to adding the link to, to our podcast there. Yeah, and, yeah <laughs> such Excellent. a great conversation. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for being with us here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It, it was fantastic. You were both just had wonderful questions. I really appreciate it. Good, good. Great. That's great to hear. So um, thank you so much to all our listeners for joining us today. And if if you do love this podcast, we really encourage you to leave a review. We really helps us so people can find us better. Um, and also, if you're listening to this podcast and you don't subscribe to our Dirt on the Past podcast, please hit that little follow button at the top on either Spotify or iTunes. That would be great. And that way it'll show up in your feed each week. And so thanks for listening today, and we hope you can join us again to find out more about the, the dirt, dirt on the past. past. And before we go, we always like to give a big thank you to the Museum of the Rockies for the use of the studio space. And thanks to the Museum of the Rockies, Chelsea Hogan, Melissa Dawn, Ashley Hall over there in the corner, and Michael Fox. And also thanks to Lawson Alegria for mixing the music for this podcast. Thanks so much, everyone.